This is Bloomberg Business Week. Insight from the reporters and editors who bring you America's most trusted business magazine. Plus, global business, finance, and tech news. The Bloomberg Business Week podcast with Carol Messer and Tim Stenebeck from Bloomberg Radio. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Bloomberg Business Week weekend podcast. Nothing like a mellow week during the dog days of summer. Not so much, huh, Tim? I mean, I thought everyone was on vacation. <laughs> Apparently not. They might be, but Fed officials are not. <laughs> no, not at all. We had Fed speak, more news about banks, inflation, also AI's potential impact on the financial system and the job market. We're going to get into all of that later on this hour, along with a very important story about how the U.S. is driving gun exports and fueling violence around the world. It's a rather sober story. Yeah, it really is. We begin, though, Carol, with Disney, the world's largest entertainment company, announcing a third quarter earnings beat, also saying capital spending and outlays for movies and TV shows are coming in lower than projected. About $3 billion worth of those savings are due to production cuts tied to the writer and actor strikes that are happening in Hollywood. Meantime, we learned just ahead of that earnings report, about 24 hours before it, that Disney is getting into the sports betting business with casino operator Penn Entertainment. We asked Bloomberg News Entertainment editor Chris Palmieri about the implications. Well, big deal for ESPN. You know, this is something uh, Disney historically didn't like to get into gambling. They wouldn't license the characters, the slot machines, or put put them on their uh, cruise lines. But a couple years ago, then CEO Bob Chapek said, "Oh, I think that's changed. We really need to get some money out of this ESPN sports betting uh, situation." And that was talked. They talked to a lot of people in the business. Uh, but now they found their partner, a uh, very interesting choice. Penn is a uh, regional casino operator that bet big on online sports. Uh, their biggest uh, you know, bet was a Canadian uh, sports betting uh, brand called The Score, but they also had bought Barstool for about $500 million. And uh, Barstool, of course, very controversial figure in Dave Portnoy, uh, it caused them trouble with uh, regulators in some states. Uh, and so uh, the CEO, Jay Snowden, decided to do this deal with ESPN and get rid of Barstool. Hey, I, would, uh, I feel like there's... I mean, from... Uh, hold on. Sorry. What? Go. I'm sorry. Go. There's Go. like no polar opposite bigger polar opposite well, to Barstool and Dave Portney than Mickey Mouse and Disney. Except, <laughs> except, wait, go back, right, Chris? Because wasn't it a few years ago, two, three years ago, ESPN, didn't they create a studio in Vegas and it was all about sports betting? Right, yeah, they've slowly inched in. They've taken a lot of advertising dollars from sports betting companies. Everybody has. Um, so, you know, but to actually use the ESPN brand in an online Sports app, which is what this is going to be, ESPN Bet. This is a this is a whole new level. So, is this a Chapek move or an Iger move? Mm. It, sort of the embracing of sports betting began with Chapek, but he didn't close the deal. So, you got to credit Iger for this. this. Back then, the rumor was that they were going to partner with DraftKings, uh, but that didn't happen. Uh, so, you know, a lot of money for ESPN at a time it could use it. Frankly, one point five billion dollars be paid over 10 years. They got additional stock warrants in Penn, uh, and uh, Penn has the, uh, you know, right to exclude, uh, you know, um, sorry, to uh, continue the deal for another 10 years. So, um, so a lot, a long-term relationship uh, that lucrative potentially to both sides. All right. So help me out here. We've got a company, uh, Disney, well-known for so many different businesses. It's a $161 billion market cap. It does report earnings tomorrow. Um, and I'm thinking about the financial side of this deal. Uh, we're looking at, for 2023, almost $90 billion in revenue forecast, if I look at the FA function on the Bloomberg. How does a deal like this move the revenue needle or the earnings needle, the financial picture for Disney? It's a pretty pretty nice bump there, uh, you know, 150 million dollars a year, and uh, you know, presumably there'll be some other uh, gains, uh, you know, on the stock that they're they're getting from Penn. So you know, that's n- that's not uh, nothing, and uh, it hasn't clear yet. They're going to do a presentation tomorrow how it's going to work in terms of advertising. Uh, so right now, Penn is paying for the name, but what about additional advertisements you may put on the? ESPN networks, um, you know, ESPN isn't saying if this is the exclusive betting partner, but that doesn't mean they can't still take ads from FanDuel or DraftKings or some other player. Oh, that's a good so, point. Yeah, so yeah, potentially still a lot of money here for, for well, Disney and ESPN. Or if you're DraftKings or, or FanDuel, do you really want to advertise on, on ESPN? You know, it's like you saw the car makers pull back from advertising on, on Twitter after 
Elon Musk bought it because you're not going to want to you know give the guy who runs your biggest EV competitor money. Um, okay, so lots of questions here, Chris. <laughs> I wanted to start with like a a, a cultural question or like a sort of brand tarnishing question. Maybe I'm in the minority, but I associate Penn with Barstool and with Dave Portnoy. And I'm wondering if there's any brand or reputation risk to Disney associating Mm. itself with a company that literally until, you know, what, 10 minutes ago, 30 (laughs) minutes ago, had embraced had uh, embraced Dave Portnoy and and all the controversy that he that he brings with him. Right. You know, the worst of the stuff about Portnoy, you know, allegations that he really mistreated women, uh, came out after the acquisition. Uh, Jay Snowden, the CEO of Penn, did defend Portnoy, kind of, publicly after those things. So there is that issue. But the very fact that they're sort of cutting him loose entirely suggests that, you know, they, you know, they didn't keep him around in some fashion, you know, they're saying goodbye. Uh, that might have been a condition by Disney, to your point. Um, but I don't I, think this necessarily hangs on Penn uh, so much, uh, you know, because they are cutting him. And the question also is how, how much Portnoy is paying for the business. Uh, as I said, they, Penn paid about $550 million for Barstool over a couple of years. Um, I, I suspect that uh, Portnoy is buying it back for a whole lot less. Well, okay. So as you think about Disney, right, the reporting earnings tomorrow, and I'm curious, you know, I'm sure there's going to be a few questions about this on the call. Um, <laughs> how are you thinking about the Disney story right now and the evolution? And now that Bob Iger is back and we know he's going to be there for a few more years. Um, we got that news, what, last month. Uh, so how are you thinking about it and what, what the Disney story, the Disney company story is going forward. You know, some very interesting language in the press release about this deal. Mm-hmm. You know, they specifically said ESPN was getting the $1.5 billion, ESPN was getting the warrants. Hmm. Uh, you know, under, uh, Disney only owns 80% of ESPN, and Hearst Corp owns the other 20%. Uh, so that just may all there, all there is to it, but it also could be establishing that ESPN is this sort of separate business that will soon start reporting entirely separate financials, uh, you know, from, from Disney. Historically, it's all been lumped together. So uh, you can read what you may <laughs> into that. Um, I mean, I'm, you know, uh, am I reading like a private equity coming in and buying it? Like or what? an IPO? You know, the last, Iger has had sort of, yeah. sort of mixed comments about this. Uh, his most recent statements were that he believed that ESPN was a business worth keeping, and uh, they needed to be in the sports business, so he may elaborate. They're, they're now looking for another strategic partner. This is that's a separate issue from this. This this is the sports betting partner. Uh, they're still looking for an investor. It's presumed to be a large tech company or uh, or uh, possibly one of the sports leagues that would sort of offer something more than money to them as they make this grand transition into the online uh, world. I should note that shares of Penn in the after hours right now up. 24%. So bouncing around, but investors are certainly happy in the, the after, in, you know, after hours. Does this, is this, how bad of news is this for, and this is back to, you know, less on Disney as a, an entire company, more on this part, new partnership, Chris. What about for the other companies like the DraftKings, uh, the FanDuel's, the points bets? What does it mean for them? Well, it's it, it's interesting because the business, the the battle is already in a way well been won. I mean, FanDuel has something like forty five percent market share of mm. sports betting in the U.S. I think DraftKings is twenty two percent. Coming up close is MGM, Bet MGM, and then Caesars. You put them all together, you're you're way past eighty uh, percent. You know, controlled by just four companies. So wow. so Penn, in a way, was already and also ran. Uh, it's, you know, it's interesting, you know, they're the ones paying one and a half billion dollars in cash and, and their stock jumps. <laughs> Disney didn't really move much. Uh, seems like Disney's getting a pretty good deal out of this. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's still a big risk for Penn. I mean, yes, they're getting the premier name in sports media. Uh, no question about that. And all the reach that all the ESPN channels have. Uh, but they've still got to earn it back in the marketplace, which is ferociously competitive. I will say, Carol, uh, shares of DraftKings in the after hours down more than 9% on this news. Wow. So we're seeing certainly some reaction. Um, so what does Portnoy end up with? 
Am I missing something? He's, he's tweeted a couple times, which, you know, I can't read his tweets because I'm not logged into Twitter and, you know, Elon Musk changed it. But he tweeted that Barstool is back and that, uh, you know, breaking news, he, he bought it. Huh. What do, you, what do you think, Chris? Well, I think he was probably chaffing under the corporate, uh, you know, ownership, the uh, idea that, mm. you know, he had to answer to casino regulators all around the country. Uh, you know, that probably didn't go well with him and so now he can go back to private ownership of his his business and and continue to say whatever he wants without the same level of pressure i think in his twitter bio or x bio he says he owns a ton of penn stock do we know anything about how you know that ownership changes does he still have penn stock has he divested i haven't penn stock? heard about that um in fact we were never ever really to crack how much he had of barstool to begin with so um but you know it's it's a sizable amount of money, and I, have, I haven't heard anything of any divestitures by him. Anything interesting about the timing of this news to you, Chris? Well, it, it, to your earlier question about Bob Iger and what he's doing, you know, he's, he's had a rough time mm-hmm. uh, since he came back in November. Really, nothing has worked. Um, a lot of trouble, continued deterioration in TV, continued losses in Disney Plus, uh, you know, the movie business. And not doing great, uh, so um, he's got his work cut out for him, and and he can at least point to this as you know getting one deal done. That's a significant one. Yeah, I do wonder too. Like, I mean, it, you know, obviously, kind of setting the tone by this deal that is going to you know take up a lot of the oxygen on the analyst but, call. But Carol, I mean, what? how big of a deal when it comes to Disney's business? And this mm-hmm. is a great question for Chris too. I mean, when it comes to Disney's business. Yes, we're talking about this, and we've been talking about it for 10 minutes because it's breaking news and it's really interesting, but at the end of the day, to what extent is this going to affect Disney's bottom line? Like you said, Chris, it's not moving Disney shares. No, but if you think about uh, a standalone ESPN, it becomes more significant. Hmm. You know, it's not going to solve everything, but um, and it gets them out in the online world. And, you know, they obviously were big players, but, you know, it, it establishes that relationship with the betters uh, who are sports fans. And so this, you know, it, this is definitely a positive for ESPN. So, hey, listen, I am wondering, Chris, when it comes to the call tomorrow, what is it that you think investors or analysts should be asking about this deal when it comes to Disney? Well, some of the questions there, what are, what are the uh, ancillary benefits and revenue opportunities for, for ESPN here? Uh, how does it impact other, um, you know, stream? Uh, Sports betting companies, like you said, mm-hmm. um, you know, uh, it's uh, what does this say about sort of uh, ESPN's future as a standalone company? Um, does it, you know, impact anything with some of the other partners it's seeking? Uh, we, we talked about these tech companies or leagues. So, uh, yeah, be, like you said, this is going to be a big subject on the call tomorrow for Bob Iger. I'm you sure. know what's, what's interesting? I always think about, I can't even now, you'll know better than I will, how many years ago was where everybody was like writing off ESPN, <laughs> even though it was such a juggernaut for the company. But right when those, was it the subscriber numbers started to come down and it's just like, Interesting. I mean, I'm looking at our preview for yeah. earnings, right? We're looking at what 25.8 million ESPN plus subscribers. Chris, Seems like a decent number. Chris, just in the last minute that we have with you, I'm kind of obsessed with this cultural question mm. and cultural fit and, and whether or not we can still sort of like think about Disney as a company the same way we thought about it when You're we really were, when we were growing up. You're really worried about Minnie kicking Mickey out well, of the well, house. You know, here's, not, here's, what Bob, here's how Bob Jake, uh, answered that question before, because the issue was, would, could Disney even be in betting a lo- at all? Yeah. You know? and, and, and they historically fought casinos in Florida forever. And so uh, Chapek's answer was the, 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 the customers, of Disney and ESPN were distinct that the ESPN fans really wanted more sports betting. Uh, they didn't see an issue with it, and that's why he began this pursuit of a sports betting deal. Well, I just think about it from a content perspective, too. I mean, you, 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 know, you see the F- FX and FXX on Hulu, um, which is, you know, uh, you know, Disney owns a big port. Disney owns FX from its Fox yeah. acquisition. Uh, and, you know, the, the content there is like not Disney content by any means, Chris, just, you know, 10 yeah. seconds. Yeah, there, there's there's no question that the sports betting has just become palatable in a lot of, uh, I mean, it's taken off like yeah. wildfire across the country. 
Uh, and it's, yeah. you know, it's, it's almost as gold as Mickey Mouse. So I think. <laughs> the betting bars, the betting roller coaster, the betting, going to cruise Space ship, Mountain. you can bet on the cruise it, ships. Like, look at the bet synergies. Bet you I can get in Space Mountain within an hour of waiting in this line. <laughs> exactly. Chris Palmieri, thank you so much. Bloomberg News Entertainment Editor Chris Palmieri joining us out there from the West Coast. We should note that Dave Portnoy reacquired the Barstool brand that he founded for just $1.00. Penn Entertainment said it could take a loss of up to $850 million on the transaction. You think it was in crypto, a check, a dollar? What do you think it was? I, I, I mean, it's the first time, he said it's the first time in 10 years that he's fully owned it. It's a really fascinating deal this past week. All right. The ESPN and Penn Entertainment News, though, as we said, just about 24 hours before Disney actually reported earnings, that came on Wednesday. And a bit of Disney news on that earnings call. The company announced it's raising prices for some streaming subscriptions by as much as 27 percent. We got reaction and reasoning from Bloomberg Intelligence technology and media analyst Gita Ranganatha. They have pricing power and they know it and they're going to exercise it. And this is what it's really coming down to now in the streaming wars, right? So the, the subscriber hyper-focus is over and done with. Now it's all about ARPU growing revenue per user, and that's exactly what Disney is doing. This should pad not only the top line, but also the bottom line. Okay, I'm not going to defend Disney, Gita. I'm not going to defend any of the companies that are raising prices left and right here. But I am going to point out that in the previous life, when there were no streaming services, when we were just paying one single cable provider every year for everything, <laughs> they raised their prices every year and no news was ever made. <laughs> yeah, but they did it gently. They did. Uh, <laughs> and they're not around it. <laughs> I don't think they did a 27% increase. They did it like 3 to 4% every year. So this one, does, do you expect this to lead to churn? So it might lead to some churn, I think, on the margin, but I think this is really mm. where all of the streaming players are headed, right? So it's going to come down to a shakeout, and Disney and, and Netflix are actually going to force that shakeout because at the end of the day, you're only going to be able to spend X amount of dollars per month on streaming, and they're basically telling you, choose, you know, make your pick and see which are the services that you want the most, that you need the most. Uh, and they're hoping that Disney and, you know, maybe Netflix is hoping that its service will, will prominently feature there. You know, it's really interesting, right? Because we also, you know, you know, and I want to take the bigger picture of Disney, their post earnings, the things jumping out at you, because they did report, right, their loss from streaming narrowed by half to $512 million in that fiscal third quarter, but it was still far less than what management had forecast about three months ago. Give us all the picture that is Disney and how you see it. Yes, I think, uh, you know, this quarter was really more about, you know, of course, we knew that the numbers were not going to be the greatest. Um, having said that, though, of course, the profit numbers did come up slightly better than expected, as you just pointed out. The streaming subscribers, however, was a miss. But I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing, because the, the subscribers that they lost was were really 12 and a half million subscribers lost on their Hotstar product, which is, you know, their Indian service. That is a very low revenue generating product. So it's not a high value subscriber that they're that they're losing. And so I think that's okay. The street is kind of okay with that. But, but sorry to cut you off there, Gita, but the, the, shouldn't the street have expected that because they came in substantially below estimates, so the street's estimates? Shouldn't that have been baked into the estimates? They did bake in, uh, you know, about three and a half, four million losses. This came in, of course, substantially yeah. higher. So cricket, you know, I, I think they kind of underestimated the power of cricket oh, okay. in, in the Indian subcontinent. Okay. Um, what else is important? We see Disney, though, lower in the aftermarket. What else do we need to know? And unfortunately, only got about 45 seconds. Yes, I think the, the other key thing that we really need to look at is parks. And what are the trends at parks? Parks actually brings in 70% or 75% of Disney's operating profit this year. So it's really key wow. to understand what the trends are looking like. I think in the domestic parks, we are seeing some softness. Uh, that was kind of offset by international strength because this was the first time that we had all of the international parks open after all of those COVID closures. But it's going to be interesting to see what exactly they're saying about attendance and occupancy rates. The transformation at Disney, a new Disney, it's underway? I, I definitely hope so, Carol. So it's, it, you know, it's, it's going to be all about the strategic vision. We're already seeing some of those, yeah. those, those pieces in motion with, with the ESPN deal. We'll have to see and what they do next. Ah, you're incredible. Kita Ranganathan of our Bloomberg Intelligence team. Thank you. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 3 to 6 Eastern. Listen on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, and the Bloomberg Business app. Or watch us live on YouTube.
All right, everybody. Um, this story definitely caught our attention uh, when we were reading in this morning. It is a most read on the Bloomberg. It's also because it's the Bloomberg Big Take, which means our top editors here at Bloomberg News deem this a story that we really all must check out and read. It is a Bloomberg exclusive, and it gets into, Tim, how the U.S. drives gun exports and fuels violence around the world. We do want to point out that Every Town for Gun Safety, which advocates gun safety measures, is backed by Michael Bloomberg, founder and majority owner of Bloomberg News, parent Bloomberg LP. For more on this story, we welcome Bloomberg News Investigations Team manage, Managing Editor Flynn McRoberts, joining us from our Chicago Bureau. Uh, Flynn, just an incredible deep dive. One you know, I got to tell you, when you read a story like this and you're like, I've never considered how American made weapons can be exported for, for terror around the world, which is something I had never considered. You, you know that it's just an incredible narrative. Give us an idea of how the story came together. Thanks, Tim. So our, uh, r- our reporting team, Mike Riley, David Koshinevsky and Eric Fan, were looking at uh, what had, had obviously there's been uh, much concern with good reason with domestic with violence and, and mass shootings in the United States. But we wondered what is happening with the the, the almost the near saturation point of, of gun ownership in the U.S. We're up to 400 million uh, wep, wep, uh, weapons owned by civilians in the, in the United States, more than the population. And we wondered what are gun companies doing facing those kind of figures. And what we found is that they're, look, they're, they're turning overseas to expand sales in, in other countries. And in doing so, they've got not just the, uh, not just the, uh, the realization, but the active engagement of the U.S., uh, of the federal government to encourage those sales. So Flynn, let's get into it. Because we, you know, we often talk about here at Bloomberg the U.S. influence around the world on business and mm-hmm. culture and trends and politics, if you will, uh, so much. Many often would argue it's positive, certainly not when it comes to guns. So how is it that a bit player in the U.S. market two decades ago, so central to the story and so central to what's happening overseas? So uh, Sig Sauer, you're talking about it. The, that was a, it was for many, for generations, actually, uh, they, the Sig Sauer uh, was making rifles during the Seven Years' War to give you a sense of how old the company was. But in, in 2000, it was, uh, it was sold uh, to new owners, and they uh, were looking to, uh, looking to expand sales, and they realized that the gun restrictions, gun export restrictions in Europe, particularly in Germany, uh, were, were in, getting increasingly, uh, increasingly tight, and they wanted to find an alternative. So in uh, 2000, uh, 2004, they hired a man, Ron Cohen, who as chief operating officer and, officer, and shortly after that as CEO. And Cohen uh, aggressively pushed uh, the, uh, the export of weapons and realized if we're going to do that, we need to move our manufacturing uh, to the United States, which they did. They're now uh, headquartered in, uh, in New Hampshire. And they've been from there. They've been able to aggressively, uh, aggressively pursue uh, international deals uh, in places like Thailand, which we, we write about uh, in uh, in Colombia. And they've gone from being a bit player to the the largest U.S. exporter of firearms. It's really remarkable. What about when it comes to? regulations in in other countries when it comes to importing these weapons of war because we oftentimes hear the narrative here in the u.s you know you don't see mass shootings happen in in other and or you don't see gun violence in other countries like you see here in the u.s but but reading your story there were so many examples of this type of well the story from the team i should say the one that you oversaw as managing editor Mm -hmm. of the investigations team there are so many examples of of mass shootings and gun violence outside of the u.s where laws are different. Yes, I, the, what we we looked at uh, Thailand specifically because that that is where that's the the uh, six hours biggest international sales uh, success, and sadly, it's also a place one of the uh, sites of one of the worst uh, uh, worst massacres in in Thai history and even in in uh, and globally. And that was uh, yeah, October of last year. Uh, a a, a, a recently retired police officer, uh, with armed with a, a sugarcane machete and a six hour uh, P365, uh, stormed into a nursery school and killed uh, tw- uh, killed 23 children and two teachers and went on to kill a total of 36 people. And the gun that he used, that P, that six hour P365, 
he obtained through something uh, what Thailand calls the welfare gun program, which is a way, uh, which is a program in a country that has pretty, that has very strict gun regulations, except this major loophole, and that welfare gun program allows former police officers and military to to buy at a very steep discount uh, these pistols. The problem was the Thailand. Uh, Gun shops in Thailand, in total, all gun shops in Thailand can only sell roughly 15,000 pistols a year. The, that Sig Sauer contract, just the first of two, made, um, flooded the country with 150,000, ten times that amount. And that there was, it, it basically became a new asset class. And fortunately, they they were able to. Uh, police were uh, uh, many of those one those weapons wound up being diverted to to criminals to organize crime syndicates because there were just it was the incentive to resell those guns, uh, that, and at which are very difficult to trace. Uh, it, it, it allowed them to uh, allowed much to basically flood the uh, f uh, flood Thailand with all these what turned into you know criminal guns. Right, because they got them at below market prices. Right, they got That's a deal right. on them, and then they could turn That's them right. around. And, and you know what's interesting is there was a story at the very beginning. I mean, a line, excuse me, um, mm -hmm. where it said the federal government, U.S. federal government, has helped push international sales of rapid fire guns to record levels. I want to kind of make the connection of how we can kind of blame the U.S. for getting more guns out there. I think many people would argue part of the problem is, like you said, there's 400 million <laughs> consumer guns or guns in the hands of consumers here in the United States. That number is staggering. That when you have more guns around, there's going to be more problems. How is it that the U.S. federal government, Democrats and Republicans alike, had a role in this change, and I kind of want to get from the shift of oversight going from the State Department, which seems probably like the rules were a little bit more stringent, to commerce, which is like basically let's sell stuff. That that's right, and this and and to be fair, uh, this this started under uh, under Barack Obama's uh, 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 during his second term, and they were trying to rationalize the uh, the rules where the State Department. Would handle. They thought, well, let's, let's the State Department should handle like, heavy military hardware like fighter jets and artillery and so forth. But we should let the Commerce Department handle uh, handle uh, civilian weapons, small arms. Uh, but at, uh, even even at that time, uh, particularly Democrats in Congress raised the concern that this with, that the that moving oversight to the business friendly Commerce Department would inevitably lead to far more sales uh, and looser looser regulations. And in fact. Uh, th it, that's exactly what happened. So when, when once the rules took effect in 2020, uh, they, they, uh, those, those sales of, of semi-automatic weapons uh, went up, depending on the year, went up as, as much as uh, sometimes 50 percent, times sometimes even double. And and um, members of Congress are are saying this is exactly what we expected when you shifted oversight to the to the Commerce Department. And so the. The you know the Commerce Department again its its role is to help you know help Boeing sell more planes help you know Micron sell more chips, mm -hmm. um, but when you when you apply that to you to uh, gun manufacturers it obviously has deadly consequences and we document that. Yeah, it's interesting. It actually makes me think of of, of what happened with cigarettes as well here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Right when we saw regulations yeah, change in the U.S. with cigarettes and fewer people here smoke. What did the American tobacco companies do? What did the global tobacco companies do? They went around the world. They went <laughs> to developing countries. They went to emerging mm -hmm. economies. Um, Flynn, how much of a boon has this been for American manufacturers of guns? So the the, the we, we tracked it from uh, 2005, which is a year after the assault weapons ban. Uh, w was was ended in the United States, and since that time, there's been a cumulative 3.7 million uh, semi-automatic pistols and rifles that have been that have been sold uh, by U.S. gun I, gun manufacturers. Okay, many, I, gotta, I gotta tell you though, I hear that number. That's tiny compared to the number of of guns that Americans own. 400 million more right. guns than people that, in this country. That's right, but those are th that's 3.7 million going to countries with. Uh, with, in places like Guatemala, for instance, where uh, where the where the, the where the institutions are, there, you know, the State Department has condemned in Guatemala, for instance, the the uh, public corruption and the inability of the government to to track these guns when they're when they're coming in. So, a, a relative, what seems like a small number of weapons to Americans. It has an outsized impact in, in a country country like Guatemala or Thailand or even we're seeing in Canada. So, what about the German owners? They okay with all of this? So they, uh, the new owners, the, the, 
were initially uh, initially reluctant to of the sort of Americanization of, of the company. They they were interested in they, they you know again this was a company with a history of hunting rifles and and you know high end you know high end pistols and so forth. They initially. Uh, uh, were concerned about it, but but they once uh, Cohen uh, reoriented the co company, you know, and moved manufacturing to the United States and and boosted sales. They have not, uh, you know, they've approved his plans and have not objected. We reached out to them to talk to them about this, and they did not respond. Yeah, there's a point in the story, and I, and I want you to talk to me a little bit about Ron Cohen, but basically. It talks about him hiring ex-Special Forces soldiers and others who understood military culture. He told employees he was giving the company a new mission, arm the good guys. Um, this is a guy who, I guess, employees called the commander. Um, it's an interesting, as you guys you know, reported on this specific company, it, it sounds like there were some things going on that weren't so okay. That's right. That so the first big Being deal careful. that <laughs> yes, I hear it. the first the first big international deal that uh, that they that Six Hour Inc made uh, was uh, in in two thousand nine with the Colombian National Police, and the they committed to uh, they committed to to selling uh, tens of thousands of of, of uh, pistols uh, to to Colombia. The problem was. That uh, the the American um, the the American arm the Six Hour Incorporated didn't have the capacity to to make that many uh, to to uh, create, manufacture that many pistols. Mm -hmm. So what they did was they they built uh, built them in in Germany and attested the fact that they would be sold into the United States. But once they got to the United States, and this is in court documents and. Uh, uh, we, we found they relabeled them and, and sent them to Colombia. This was news to their colleagues in Germany who knew they couldn't be selling weapons to Colombia because German law prohibited guns going to a conflict zone, which at that, that, that time Colombia was. So this became uh, the German authorities investigated, and in the end, the uh, Sig and, and, and Cohen uh, reached a settlement which they. Uh, in which they acknowledged wrongdoing, and, and Cohen himself uh, was given a suspended 18-month uh, prison sentence, and Sig paid the highest uh, export fine in German history, something like 12 million euros. So that uh, that's not the only that, that's not the only case that they there have been other investigations by Sig as well. So that, that but it has not it clearly has not hurt their sales, and frankly, it has not hurt their dealings with the U.S. government, where they have now they have uh, in the wake of those investigations, they have still been awarded the uh, two major Pentagon contracts, one, uh, one for, uh, to supply sidearms to, side to the whole, to the entire U.S. military, right. and also to provide the, uh, what essentially replaced the M16 uh, as an uh, wow. uh, assault. Wow. Flynn, we only have about a minute left, a little less, yep. mm -hmm. but what's the next thread of the story here? What's been the response that, that you've gotten to the big take after it was published late yesterday, and uh, what's the next part of the story here? Mm -hmm. So we're, we're looking to see what happens in, in Congress. There, 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 uh, Elizabeth Warren, Norma Torres, there are ver various uh, Democrats in Congress who have raised concerns about this in the past, and we're, we're very curious to see if uh, our revelations do anything to uh, to uh, push reform in, 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 the, uh, in, in Washington. All right, well, we certainly will be watching, and I know you guys will be monitoring and, and updating us on it. Um, Flynn, thank you so much. We really wanted to share this story with our viewers and listeners, so I um, appreciate you uh, joining us. Flynn McRoberts, Managing Editor of the Bloomberg News Investigations Team from our Chicago Bureau. listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 3 to 6 Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business app, and YouTube. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. The remarks in the current double issue of Bloomberg Business Week center on the head of the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, Gary Gensler. We know he has been front and center in the push to weed out fraud in the crypto space. So what about the potential for financial wrongdoing when it comes to artificial intelligence? But don't worry, Gensler has a framework for dealing with AI, too. Bloomberg News Deputy Team Leader for U.S. Equities Jess Metten and I sat down with our securities enforcement reporter, Austin Weinstein, and Business Week editor Joel Weber to learn more. If there's a financial regulation issue that's been a major thing in the U.S. for the last 30 years, there's a really high chance Gary Gensler has a deep and rich history with it. 
One of the most crazy footnotes to his career is that he was one of the main drafters of the Sarbanes-Oxley law in 2001. Wow. And that barely comes up in his biography. But yes, with AI, we sat down with him and learned that his history goes back a good amount of time, back to, to when he left the CFTC in 2014. And there was a new administration that came in shortly after, and he you know, needed to find a job, and he went to MIT to teach. There, pretty early on, he zeroed in on two subjects that he really cared about. One was crypto, which he's talked a lot about, and we've all talked a lot about. And the other was artificial intelligence. He sat down with uh, Alexander Madri, one of the really most respected minds in machine learning, and just asked him, how do I learn this? And Alexander Madri gave him a 800-page book called Deep Learning. Uh, I tried to read it. I can't. And Gary Gensler <laughs> apparently can and return months how later. Much of, how much of that book did he read, Austin? I was wondering the same thing, or, Joel. Or, or, or <laughs> how, how much did he say he read? Well, so he said he read what he could understand. Um, then he also mentioned that he can code in Fortran and can do some of the differential equations. Gary Gensler probably can, just knowing his track record. Um, but... Yeah, there's probably some stuff there that uh, you know everyone would skim over. Can you can you code in Fortran? I I I, I would be lost upon entry. I had to look up what that was. <laughs> Tim 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 too. That's why. Yeah, I did too. I actually, I'm like Fortran, Fortran. I don't know what's going on here. Um, not, not the Fortran variety. Okay, uh, so so uh, so Austin, stick with stick with this because what we've seen this year has obviously captivated everyone with what open. Um, AI has accomplished and sort of what chat GPT could be capable of. If you're a regulator, that seems maybe like your nightmare. So so how is he preparing? Well, there's a few ways to prepare if you're a regulator. Um, and in fact, in 2000, 2000, uh, sorry, 2020, Gary Gensler wrote a book on how, wrote a paper on how regulators should prepare to deal with AI's implication on the financial system. And for Gary Gensler, how regulators should prepare essentially goes into what powers and what structures do regulators have to deal with AI now and what don't they have and what risks do I have that they'll pose that hit that intersection point where their powers fall short. And a few of those things fall into concerns like liability. And so we had a really interesting discussion about, say when you're designing a bot to beat someone in chess, are you designing that bot to beat someone? Or are you programming them to know the exact pathways that'll make them the most percentage more chance of winning each time? And is that intention? And the question of intention matters a lot for a securities mm. regulator because that's the basis of most frauds. And most of the crimes that the SEC charges are frauds. And so there's some really interesting questions of explainability. If you can't answer why an algorithm made a certain decision or created a certain image or published a certain thing, can you say that it acted with intent? And so Gary Gensler has been thinking a lot about this problem of explainability. And he published one of the first rules in the broad federal bureaucracy on this last month when he said that most asset managers and brokers will have to do an assessment when they use AI as to will this lead to any conflicts of interest for the firm? So agnostic of what this tool does, will you look at that tool? And when you look at that tool, does it benefit you at the expense of the client or does it benefit the client and perhaps the firm as well? So there's some really thorny, really philosophical questions at, at hand here. You also talk about how he argues that a lot of this so-called decentralized finance isn't really decentralized. What's your take on that? So it's the sort of theme that Gary Gensler has carried within both crypto and artificial intelligence, that a lot of the words and technologies here obfuscate responsibility, obfuscate what's truly happening. You know, cryptocurrency has the root crypto you know, which is a way to hide, to disguise. But at the end of the day, most every crypto transaction is traceable from one wallet to one wallet without much difficulty. It took some time to learn it. And then you go into decentralized finance. He brought up the, the question of, okay, is it, is it 
decentralized finance platform decentralized in the way it pays its lawyers? Because at the end of the day, some client, some service provider is providing that to the system. And so there's an entity making a one-to-one transaction there and take that into artificial intelligence as well. Is it artificial? If it's programmed to do a specific thing and uses machine learning and other tools to get to that specific thing. So that these those words and these technologies can really obfuscate what's what's really happening here in the eyes of someone like Gary Genzo. So that seems uh, like a you know rain cloud um, sort of take on AI when some, there's been so much enthusiasm in the markets at least for it. So what does he think is going to happen? Like you know like is it is this going to end badly? And you know you look at crypto and sort of his response to it, and it feels like you know he's finally bringing down a hammer. Like what about what about AI? With Gensler, that's sort of a twofold thing. Uh, he is proposing rules now to make sure that he can set some guidelines for AI. But he did say in our interview, it'll be the crisis of 2032 or 2028 or whatever. And the after action report will really be about an issue involving machine learning and AI, simply because- That makes me think that that report, it makes me think that re- report may not be written by AI. At the end of the day, when writing his after action reports after a crisis, he brought up the idea of model dependency which is the idea, and I'm going to explain this terribly, I do not have a PhD in computer science, but that at the end of the day, all these financial firms will use at about two to three base or foundation models, the underlying logic systems that make machine learning and AI work. And these models might disguise how they all get to the same result. And it may determine that they were all training on one small piece of data about the mortgage market or about leveraged loans or about treasuries. And without communicating it, they had a whole bunch of risk based in these models. And that that risk blew up when say that one statistic was programmed by someone who Hmm. wasn't putting in the data right or had some malign intent. And that can blow up the economy with these huge systems trained on AI. So uh, it raises it raises the question, Austin, about what Gensler thinks the solution is in terms of guardrails, in terms of regulations. I mean, how does he prevent a meltdown in 2028 or 2032 that's brought on by AI? The great question and one that he's definitely trying to grapple with and understand now. It is important to say a lot of the powers here and the regulation of AI are beyond the SEC. And he really can only oversee the capital markets and space that he regulates things like responsibility of use and legal liability of questions for Congress, the FTC, the DOJ, Treasury, all these other institutions. But he is a member of the Financial Stability Oversight Council, and he has asked a lot of his staff to start looking at issues of concentration, stability, and, and ways that he can set the economy and set the financial system up to be more resilient in the case of a AI catastrophe. That was Bloomberg News Securities Enforcement reporter Austin Weinstein and Business Week editor Joel Weber with Jess Metten and me. All right, you're listening to Bloomberg Business Week. Up next, we've got more on AI as we examine the impact this technology is likely to have on the American worker, maybe global workers, to be fair. The bottom line is about 30% of the activities that U.S. workers do today could be automated away by the end of 2030, so over the next seven years. We break down a new McKinsey study on where displaced workers will turn and how AI will reshape the labor landscape. This is Bloomberg. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 3 to 6 Eastern. Listen on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, and the Bloomberg Business app. Or watch us live on YouTube. You guys talked about Zoom. Yeah, I mean, if you think about perhaps the company that most epitomizes working from home. Yeah. It's Zoom. I mean, it was not just a, you know, a COVID stock, but it was also what we were all learning how to use in the early days of the pandemic, right? We talked about it yesterday because even they're telling employees to get back to the office, Wait, Carol. What? Yeah, I know. Zoom, if you live near a Zoom a Zoom office, you got to come in a couple days a week. So we've seen Amazon, Chipotle, BlackRock, companies as varied as those telling, hey, workers, workers, hey, you got to come back to the office. Yeah, it's interesting, right? We're seeing that uh, post-COVID uh, several years out and how that is kind of, yep, they're coming back to the office. The other thing at play, right? we see when it comes to how we are working going forward is just the explosion of what the think about AI around artificial intelligence, generative AI, and what does it mean 
eventually for work. Well, fortunately, McKinsey is out with a new report that says 12 million workers are going to move into new lines mm. of work by 2030. I guess I'm not saying fortunately. That's Fortunately, there's a report. Yeah. You know, we'll see if it's fortunately or unfortunately that AI is, is forcing people to move to new lines of work. Very pleased to have with us this afternoon, Quaylin Ellen Grood, a partner at McKinsey Global Institute, joins us via Zoom from Minneapolis, a director and senior partner at the McKinsey Global Institute. Quaylin, how are you? Great. Great to be with you today. Well, it's, it's great to, to have you join us on this. So, you know, when did you guys start thinking about the impact of AI on workers? Because I think for a lot of people, uh, this is a relatively new phenomenon with the explosion of chat GPT last fall. Absolutely. We've been thinking about the future of work now for about a decade and modeling what does automation do to jobs, which are biggest gaining jobs, uh, losing occupational categories. And then to your point, just about six months ago, started to layer on to automation and COVID-19 impact, the impact of Gen AI. So now we've put all of those three things together to say, what do the future of jobs look like in the United States? All right. So play it out for us. (laughs) What do they look like? I am a robot. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah, a robot. Indeed. I, I think the bottom line is about 30% of the activities that U.S. workers do today uh, could be automated away by the end of 2030, so over the next seven years. And that, again, is through automation, COVID-19 impact, mostly affecting interpersonal interactions, and then Gen AI. Gen AI alone, if you just isolate that piece, increase that percentage by about nine or eight or nine percent. So up until about 30 percent of overall activities. There are a lot of jobs that will be um, fewer uh, in the future and there will be quite a few more. Overall, I think it's good news uh, to your to your point earlier. Uh, We will have more jobs in the future, I think, is the great news. And those jobs will be higher paying jobs. They will be also higher skilled jobs that on average require higher average education. The tough news or the tough transition to get there is we don't necessarily have the workforce today that is best suited for those jobs of the future. So first, where are we gaining? Where are we losing? Uh, We are gaining jobs in healthcare, in STEM categories, and in transportation, delivery, all of those other areas. We are losing jobs in primarily four big occupations. And those four occupations make up about 80% of the job losses between now and 2030. That is customer service, okay. uh, food, food service and sales, uh, production or manufacturing, and office services or assistance. And you've all seen kind of food kiosks at fast food restaurants, right? We've seen all of these different elements, but when you add them together, those four occupations make up 80% of the occupational switches, which is about 12 million of them between now and 2030. So before we get into that, that's a lot. But I've also seen it. I've done it, right? I'm at an a airport. I order on a an iPad and then stuff just gets delivered. I've gone to a retailer I'm, here. I'm sorry, but I'm what? You and I've done this before. And sometimes it works. It's sometimes it, it's also just terrible. It's n- <laughs> not all the time. Uh, maybe I'm just thinking of Newark Airport. I okay. don't know. No offense. Oh, come on. I know. Pick but on the New Jersey. We've had some fun times there. We we have it kind of works. I oh god, I don't know. It doesn't always work. It's like not It perfect. doesn't always work. That's, but I but I'm amazed at that. I think how many times I check out at a supermarket. I just and I go there. A Target, um, a retailer. Zara, you go to Zara. You drop it in a bin. That's it, amazing. It shows up. That blows my mind. It yeah. Shows up on I like H and M or Uniqlo does that too. It's amazing. Do they? Yeah. And and you check out and you take off the safety. You know, uh, whatever they what do they call them? That you know what I mean. Uh, yeah, the anti theft thing. The anti theft things like. I do it all. And like somebody's watching you, but it's like, whoa. So I don't know. Um, Is the experience better though? That's the thing. Like, you know, speaking of airports, we've done this, you know, we've gone to airports together where there's nobody to actually check us in. Right. And we're like, you know, we know it's because of cost cuts. And we're flying business. Thank you, Bloomberg. (laughs) And we do everything. But what's the balance here, Quaylin, that uh, of actually having like an experience that's better? Because who cares if, not who cares, but it's like, it's one thing to replace people. It's another thing to replace them with, you know, an inferior product. And I thought all the companies were about customer service, customers first. Not apparently. And there is absolutely a balance and there's also a bit of a transition pain point to get there. But I think the alternative is not always great customer service in person. It could be they're understaffed. They don't actually have the people. And so the alternative is, do you want to wait for 10, 15 minutes to flag somebody down to get your order? Or do you want to enter it into the iPad? Or do you want to pay $2 more for that sandwich? 
or not. And so I think those are the trade-offs that, that we're really wrestling with. Well, when does the cost come to us? Because I go to the supermarket and man, I'm doing all the work and, or I go to the airport and they're like, you want an extra bag? You know, you know. So when does that cost come back to the customer? I think we've already started to see it, right, on so Mm -hmm. many um, different products. Some of that has been passed along. Some of the costs have been kind of captured and improved, better efficiency and effectiveness, part which has not then been passed on in higher prices, even though supply chains have been challenged and and prices across many categories have gone up, most notably in uh, in service and and gas areas. Uh, I think some of that will flow through over the next few years. We'll see where it all settles out. But I do think there are automation improvements that are being made and then you know consumers do stand to benefit from some of that hey really quickly 30 seconds because we've got a story coming up about the lack of workers in the healthcare area you said we are seeing gains in health health care 30 seconds what specifically yeah uh frankly across the board given consumer spending aging in the united states and frankly uh, in many developed countries around the world so nursing um tech uh, in healthcare as well. Overall, I think we'll need quite a few more jobs in those areas. Well, that certainly fits into the story that we're going to talk about. Um, Quaylin, thank you so much. Quaylin Ellen Grood, she is director and senior partner at McKinsey Global Institute on Zoom from Minneapolis. Their latest report, Generative AI and the Future of Work in America. It wasn't so bad in Newark. Please uh, please well, enter your symptoms on this iPad. <laughs> exactly. Who do I complain to? That's the thing that bothers me. <laughs> There's no one ever to complain to. Complain to, to me, Carol. All right, I will. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 3 to 6 Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business app, and YouTube. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Plenty ahead in our second hour of the weekend edition of Bloomberg Business Week, including the continuing saga and struggles of a once adored startup. Why there is now serious concern co working office space giant WeWork could go out of business altogether. Plus, female founders are still having a hard time obtaining critical funding for their startups. We'll talk to someone who's hell bent on changing the narrative and whether she thinks Facebook would have gotten funding if it was Maria Zuckerberg behind the company and not Mark. First up this hour, investors continue to take a bite out of Beyond Meat. After reporting earnings this past week, the company cut its sales guidance and backed off its cash flow target. On Tuesday, following that news, its shares took their biggest one-day plunge since November 2020 on an intraday basis. Quite simply, Tim, it is not easy being Beyond Meat. It's not easy being Beyond Meat here in the U.S., but it's also pretty difficult being Beyond Meat when you're trying to expand into China. We've got a great story in the current issue of Bloomberg Business Week. It's all about Beyond Meat's challenges in China by Dina Shanker, Bloomberg News consumer reporter. It's again again in the current issue of Bloomberg Business Week. Read it now on newsstands online at Bloomberg.com slash Business Week and, of course, on the Bloomberg Terminal. Dina in our Bloomberg Interactive Brokers studio right now. So, Dina, you go back a few years. Starbucks, huge in China made available Beyond Meat and all of its stores, more than 3,000. You had Beyond Meat doing this big marketing campaign on the the huge mobile platforms that are there, WeChat and Cebo. We, we both seen, excuse me, the other one, the social one. <laughs> Do you have a Beyond Meat burger in your mouth? What's going on? I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Fast forward a few years, it's nowhere to be found. What's going on? Yeah, you know, uh, after their IPO in 2019, which was just huge and everyone was really excited, Ethan Brown came in and did an editorial board. And when we asked him about mm. China, he said they were going to be as aggressive as they could. And they were. They went in and they, like you said, they went into Starbucks, three menu items, 3,300 locations. They got on JD.com, all kinds of partnerships in China. But now, uh, going to find one is not so easy. And uh, Starbucks doesn't have them online at the menus, on menus anymore. JD.com, they show up, but you can't order them. They're not available. Um, there's just a whole long list of examples of partnerships that have sort of disintegrated over there. And, you know, um, there are a lot of reasons why, but I think when you strip all of the noise out, it really just comes down to the fact that just like in the US, in China, people tried them and then said, I don't really like it. It doesn't taste so good. And that's that. 
You know, what's interesting, too, is, I mean, you and I and Tim were talking, you know, a little bit earlier. Um, it just feels like these companies are trying to find strategies. And I get it going after China. I feel like every company that's out there still, even with the tensions, think about the potential in the Chinese market. What did they get wrong? Or is it just a case that China is difficult? They or is got, it something about <laughs> these plant-based <laughs> food companies? Well, I think it's a, a, a whole lot of things. The first is that uh, beef is really big here in the U.S. And the Beyond Burger was this big blockbuster uh, new product. But in China, people really don't eat beef the way they eat, for example, pork or chicken even. So uh, starting with a burger was just sort of... Uh, you know, tone deaf, I think, um, starting with pork would have made a lot more sense. Why didn't they? Has the company addressed that? They declined to comment for our story. So I could not tell you. Um, they do have a pork product and they eventually launched pork products there. Um, they eventually launched dumplings and other things. But um, what it came down to for a lot of people was the same thing as here is that it's expensive. It doesn't taste that good. It's not particularly healthy. And they're of course, they also had the pandemic lockdowns that really hurt mm -hmm. their opportunities in food service. And of course, in China, they have plenty of plant-based meal options that fit right in, that are just an ancient part of their cuisine. So if they don't want to eat meat for a meal, they can eat tofu instead. They're like, beyond meat, we've been here. We, we've been here for a long <laughs> yeah, time. That's right. We got that, this. That's exactly right. They, they had really, it really just didn't fit in. So does any of the, do any of the other products stand a chance? If, if beef didn't work, and if they have developed other products, could those work? I mean, they haven't worked. The pork hasn't say. worked? The pork, ha they're not on the websites we looked at, mm -hmm. and um, they've tried some different products there, but it's just really difficult to find a Beyond Meat product in China well, right now. Why China? Like, why, why would they choose for international expansion China? I mean, the... the, the like success in the road to success in China for if you're a US company, like there are a lot of very successful ones, but there are many more that have tried and failed. Well, I think the first is the first piece of it is just the sheer number of people. So you have so many consumers. Um, they also do consume a lot of meat in China. So it seems like a good place to try to sell your meat replacement. But that's kind of part of the problem in China. Um, just like it, just like uh, in a lot of other places, meat is a status symbol. And as you rise into the middle class, you want to eat more meat because that means you're more successful. And so trying to convince someone who maybe uh, just sort of broke into the meat bracket that, hey, actually I have something, it, it's more expensive. It doesn't taste as good. <laughs> and you're not really into burgers, but try it. Yeah. No, <laughs> it's, and, not, and it's not a good What do we know about its sell. health too, right? Yeah, right. Right, how I healthy mean, it is. Health wise, it's an ultra processed food, which is the exact kind of food that Still. we keep hearing is what we're supposed to do. Uh, avoid and that's really tough for Beyond Meat or its competitors like Impossible and ultra processed food means it's made from like derivatives of other foods and that's what pea protein is right it's not made from peas it's made from pea protein what's interesting too and I like this story this line in your story the stumbles by international brands have not deterred local companies from trying to find a lane for plant-based businesses so there are some Chinese companies trying to still tap this market, correct? Yes. And actually, um, Dico's is a restaurant chain in China that started with Beyond Meat and now is actually doing a big campaign with a Chinese plant-based meat company called Starfield. So, um, you know, it's hard to say what's going to happen, but you have to imagine that a Chinese plant-based meat company is going to cater better to Chinese consumers. I feel like Business Week has done some great coverage. Um, I don't feel like it. They have done some great coverage of this plant based protein food world. And it is interesting that it's now, what, 10 years and counting? Like how long, like these companies have been around and I feel like they're still trying to find their lane. It's very true. I mean, Beyond was founded in 2009 and um, went public in 2019. And a lot of fanfare. Yeah, really. And it was a hugely successful IPO. And I think a lot of people really had gr huge expectations for this kind of product. And I think they suffered from a mix of their own um, bad choices, bad execution, and also just 
You know, the public awareness around our diet and nutrition has really evolved so much. We all, or not we all, but a lot of people, a lot more people know to look at the nutrition facts. We all turn the boxes around. That's right. And we didn't used to do that. Yep. And we, you know, look for things like recognizable ingredients. And for a little while we thought, hey, well, it's it's got to be better than meat. But then those, it's not necessarily the case anymore. A lot of people raise questions about that. So it's, it's a tough sell right now. There's also the environmental question. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I, I, it's, it's funny. Like I, I, we went through as a family, like a whole, okay, we're going to eat the beyond and impossible stuff. And I think it was like summer of 2020 during the pandemic when everybody else did it too. And I was like, Oh, this is so (laughs) much better than meat. And then we got totally sick of it and don't eat it anymore. But the one kind of saving grace is that environmentally is it better than beef because we know isn't that, beef that the is new lane that they're pursuing good for it the is, environment it is absolutely no question about it better than meat for the environment there's just that's like beef is so bad for the environment that anything is better chicken and pork are better too but beyond meat is better than all of those no question but so are lentils and i'll just put a shout out for caviar lentils which are really good and sounds I'm, fancy you, it, you would think that they they are kind of fancy in the lentil world, but they're still a lot cheaper than right, Beyond putting it, Meat. Putting it on my, my shopping list, caviar lentils. Um, buy them on Amazon. They're right there. They're great. And like people are, there's so much more in the world of um, non-meat uh, center a plate and meal options than just alternative meats, which really, you know, it's 10 years is in, or 10 plus years, years is in some way a long time for a company to find its footing. But in, in the history of our diets, 10 years, is it's a still a pretty new product. And we've eaten meatless before them and we'll eat meatless without them. Well, Dina, I think about all the reporting you guys are doing at Business Week on the uh, plant-based protein world. Um, and I do wonder, is it a case that they just haven't figured it out? Like, as you say, 10 years is still kind of short, right, in terms of the food world. Um, I mean, it's a company that you note in the story hasn't recorded profit since early 2020. What do food industry folks say? What does the analyst community, investor community say? Well, after their... Is it time for them to pull the cord? (laughs) Well, one of the questions during earnings this week was maybe they needed to recalibrate their expectations and maybe they're more of a $300 million business. Wow. Um, And Ethan Brown, the CEO... That's niche. Yeah, Ethan Ethan said absolutely not. And he pointed to like what's going on on college campuses where young people want to eat less meat. And that's true. Young people do want to eat less meat. But what comes to mind constantly is the reference to these products as like a gateway drug to uh, eating less meat. A lot of people try them. Okay, well, that, but not my favorite, or maybe I like it. And now I'm open to more meatless options. And mm-hmm. that's that's actually great for the planet, but for Beyond Meat, that's not so good. Just for some context uh, to that comment, Dina. Uh, so back in 2019, the market cap was more than $14 billion, and, and now it's under a billion dollars. So That's a big move. That is it. That's big a change. huge move. Yeah. I want to go back to your story that's in the current issue of Bloomberg Business Week, talking about the success or rather failure of Beyond Meat in China. Are there any examples of, of, of sort of these new wave of foods like, you know, I don't know, plant-based milks or uh, plant-based eggs that actually have found success in China that you found? Um, so actually, Oatly has done relatively well in China. They're in a lot of um, a lot of uh, restaurant partnerships, uh, coffee shops, etc. Um, they have a pretty wide reach. But even Oatly has said that um, the sales have just not um, recovered as quickly post-pandemic as they expected. Um, Eat Just, the uh, plant-based egg maker, mm. they were they were doing pretty well on a small scale in China pre-pandemic, but they're no longer sold there because of what they say are basically issues with customs and trying to just get their product into the country without it spoiling. So, um, and Impossible, uh, of course, really wanted to go to China and hasn't entered yet uh, because they have a genetically modified ingredient that hasn't gotten approval. Is that heme? Is yes, that what it is? That's the soy lig hemoglobin. Oh, okay. Yeah, which is known as heme. Yeah. So it's okay to be sold in the US, but has not been approved for China. Yes. And it also hasn't been approved in uh, the EU. So yeah, it, they can't sell there. Does it make sense for them to come back and focus on the US market and see if they can figure it out? They've been trying to reduce their expenses and how much they're spending. And so I think that's a really good question. Why are you still spending so much money in China where it's ju- you're just not gaining traction? Um, why don't you bring those resources home? And um, 
I wish they had commented for the story because uh, I, th- I think that they should address that. They know how to reach you, I bet. <laughs> yeah, they do. At this point? They do. Okay. They do. Just to wrap up, um, how do you think about like what, you know, because you guys have done so much reporting, it was cover story, like on this whole world. Like what's the next thing that's kind of on your radar or how you think about it? Well, I think we're seeing consolidation in this industry right now. And one of the questions is whether all of this consolidation will eventually mean better product on the shelf for consumers. Mm. And what I wonder, I I am actually pretty confident that this industry is going to make better products. I just wonder if by the time those products hit shelves, whether anybody's even going to be interested in buying them. That they like, I wonder if they had their big shot and, and they're ever going to, I wonder if they're going to get it again. All right. Really cool stuff. Uh, and so relevant because we all keep talking about it and trying to figure out like kind of what is the, the way forward, if you will, for it. Um, Dina, thank you so much. Thank you. The story in the current issue, double issue of Bloomberg Business Week, Dina Shanker. She's Bloomberg News consumer reporter joining us in studio. Do you cover anything? What, do you cover anything outside of the, <laughs> because every time we talk to you, it's always, it's always beyond me, I impossible. I what, cover all the packages package food companies but it's just these companies just keep I every I'm always like, I gotta get out of this fake no don't stuff. get out of it oh we love because it. I want to try oh this is there's do so you, much else do you eat it but I I can't do I eat it I don't okay, okay. I don't, okay. <laughs> I, don't. I, don't. <laughs> I actually I hate when I go to a barbecue and they know I don't eat meat and then so they think they're and they give me like a beyond you're like Wrong. all right take, we're taking notes <laughs> <laughs> all right thank <laughs> you thank you thanks guy you're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast catch us live weekday afternoons from 3 to 6 eastern listen on bloomberg.com the iHeartRadio app and the Bloomberg Business app. Or watch us live on YouTube. We've been talking about a lot of different companies, Disney, Amazon. We got to talk a little bit about WeWork because, man, shares of the company falling off a cliff, down more than 38% in today's session. It is a 12 cent wow. a share stock. That's, called, that's a penny stock. Yeah, that's a pink, that's, pink call that sheets. A penny Do stock. we call this pink sheets? I mean, Carol, this is a company whose stock has plunged 98% since it went public in October 2021, wiped out nearly $9 billion in market value. It's because the company's bleeding cash, customers of its office rentals are canceling their memberships in droves. And oh yeah, WeWork said yesterday that there's, quote, substantial doubt about its ability to continue operating. This is a stunning fall. Just think back to, you know, a few years ago. This was the company that bought the, you know, Lord & Taylor building. Right, mm-hmm. we were we were talking about this as like okay, there's nothing em- more emblematic right now than physical retail being overtaken by a co-working space. You remember, it was a company that was once valued at forty seven billion dollars, making it one of the most prized startups in America. Let's get into it with Ellen Hewitt. She's Bloomberg News startup reporter who writes about WeWork today and one of the most read stories on the Bloomberg Terminal. Ellen, good to have you with us. You've been all over this story when did things get really bad for WeWork? because when it went public via that spec there was hope that hey it could actually turn itself around right i mean it's been a tough journey for WeWork. they had this huge um, implosion in 2019 when adam newman tried to take it public that obviously didn't work he resigned there was a lot of tumult and this new ceo was, that was when we learned about community adjusted ebitda Yes. Okay. <laughs> and, and and all the good stuff Ouch. from the perspectives. If you remember the the Wee family, um, the trademark of the trademark family of, of oh Wee and other things like that. This and, is crazy. Um, we work. We live. This. We grow. We spend. Yes. Yes. Um, we. That was the cover of Bloomberg Business Week in 2019. Remember? Anyway, go ahead. Yeah. Remember <laughs> elevating the world's consciousness. All yes. that stuff. Uh, no, that was a good time. Um, especially as a reporter covering that company it was so exciting. Um, there was news every day. And then in 2020, they had a new CEO come in, Sandeep Mathrani. He came in in February 2020, which is a tough time to be taking over as um, co, um, you know, CEO of a of an office startup. So um, he inherited a you know, pretty tough job, and um, WeWork offices emptied out in the first, especially in the first year of the pandemic. Um, you know, dropping to below 50% occupancy. It took them more than two years to return occupancy levels to the levels that they had been in late 2019. Um, and the company, you know, it has survived, but it has not thrived. Um, it, you know, it, it did go public in late 2021 via SPAC, but the share price has dropped, you know, today is something like 98% since um, since its original um, debut. And it just has not been able to have the turnaround that they had hoped for. So Ellen, is this a case of a company, you know, kind of cool idea in the beginning, oh my gosh, pandemic kind of screwed it up, or is it just a company that just kind of didn't really make sense. I, you know, it, what's so interesting about WeWork is I think compared to some of the other vaporware-ish um, startups that you see in Silicon Valley, 
we were kind of product that worked, that people wanted, that they were willing to pay for. It, <laughs> you know, they wanted to have office space. It uh, to me, it made sense. I think you know, during the Newman era, there was all this ebullience and 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 sort of extravagant spending and all these reasons that the company probably grew too quickly um, and and it spooked investors and all that stuff. But you know, since then, one would think that it should be able to make things right. Obviously, the pandemic was quite difficult, um, as it would be for any office startup. But you're not seeing like. Uh, Regis and, uh, and other competitors, you know, having the same issue that WeWork is right now. So it, it raises the question of whether this is something um, specific to WeWork and, and why that might be the case. I want to go back to something that you said. They were able to return to 2019 vacancy rates within two years after the pandemic. Yeah, that's yeah, remarkable. That, that, that was that was an announcement in um, came in summer of 2022. And so, yeah, I mean, they had been making slow progress. They did close a lot of their um, office locations. That was a big push in the post Newman era to so, so exit some I, of the leases. Okay, yeah. so so let me just make sure I get this stat right then. So that was the the the, the rate the, the being the percentage of occupancy. So it wasn't on a on a basis of you know total number of people who were there because they actually had fewer. They reduced leases. their space, right? Yeah, they reduced their spaces. Okay. So it's something like seventy two percent occupancy, and and of course they've tweaked a little bit how that metric is measured over the years. But it, you know they celebrated it at the time as a reasonable marker of of. Um, you know, return to power. And I, I think that was reasonable. It just seems like they haven't been able to hold on to that. That number actually dropped the, in this quarter um, compared to last quarter. And um, clearly they're projecting that things are not going to, are probably not going to work out for them. It is kind of interesting, right? In the Uberization of the world, as we talk about, of like sharing cars, sharing homes, Airbnb, like all this stuff, like we're kind of cool about this. We're open to it. it. It does feel like, especially in a post-pandemic world, as you said earlier, that this would be the ideal model, right? Of companies, I've heard it from companies like post-pandemic, they're like, yeah, when we need some space, we just rent it. You know what I mean? When we need to bring employees together, we just rent it. Now, mind you, we're hearing more about people coming back to the office <laughs> and so on and so forth. But I, I do wonder about kind of what's next for them. Yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a big question because it did seem like they were putting forth a pretty plausible story, which was in a time of uncertain working from home versus office in a time of hybrid workplace that um, employers might not want to sign 10 year leases to have their own office space, but instead turn to flexible office providers like WeWork or like any of its rivals. Um, and and one would think that that would make sense. Uh, you know, clearly, if they're making this disclosure, something is not working at WeWork. Um, and, and it, you know, it could just be that they haven't been able to um, stop the bleeding. They've just they've continued yeah. to lose money and that hasn't changed. All right. Permanent CEO. Could that help something? Could that help help out the story? <laughs> right. They've also been looking for a CEO since May um, when Sandy Pathrani, who had come over to, um, you know, sort of oversee this turnaround, left somewhat abruptly, you know, uh, suddenly enough that they did not have a replacement in mind. So they've had an interim CEO. Um, their CFO then left a week after that. Um, they actually had a big board member turnover um, in this um, on Tuesday, which they announced, you know, three board members stepping down and four new ones replacing them. There's tumult, um, and I don't know what kind of person wants to become CEO of that company, but hopefully, mm. someone does, and we can we can find out who that might be. So, just thirty seconds left, Ellen. What's what's the future of the company if it does end up having issues? If uh, you know, it could file for bankruptcy. That's what that means essentially. If it if it has trouble, it's an ongoing concern. Um, what ends up happening yeah. to the people who who mm. who are in the, the offices? I, you know, I imagine that um, competitors are excited to see that maybe they might be able to, um, you know, benefit from this either by trying to lure customers over to their own space, or um, you know, maybe there's someone who might want to come in and and take over individual locations. I think that remains to be seen, but certainly there are other people who are, I'm sure, waiting to see if there's something they can capitalize on if we work ends up going under. It's another great business school case study. Like it's really just fascinating. Ellen Hewitt, um, we always love talking with you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Startups reporter at Bloomberg News. Check her out at Ellen Hewitt on Twitter or X, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> on Zoom from San Francisco. I still can't figure it out. I just can't. This is Bloomberg. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 3 to 6 Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business app, and YouTube. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. One of the things we talk a lot about here at Bloomberg, we've done some great reporting, um, what goes on with female-founded startups? No secret that they account for only a tiny 
tiny, tiny portion of the venture capital that's deployed each year. So here's some numbers for you. In 2021, for instance, female founders secured only 2% of venture capital in the U.S. That's according to the research firm PitchBook that follows all of this, Tim. And that was a year that VC money really flowed. I mean, 2021, mm-hmm. those were the boom years. The last 18 months have been a different story entirely. We've got, got with us right now, Tess Neem Dohadwala, founding partner of Excel Star Ventures. The VC firm says it invests in, quote, clear disruptive technology. They've got a lot of med tech on there. Um, really cool stuff and really cool companies that they've invested in. They're also passionate about funding women and minority-led companies. Very pleased to have Tasneem with us this afternoon. Uh, so Tasneem, give us an idea of, of uh, what you've experienced and, and what you've experienced working as a VC and also what you've experienced as, as far as the companies that, that you funded. Is this a... Um, is the problem, I kind of know the answer here, but I'm still going to ask this anyway. Is the problem <laughs> that <laughs> only 2% of the companies are actually founded by female founders? No, I mean, I think that there it's it's a systemic problem. And I think that the issue is that it's an it's an everybody problem. It's not just, a you know, the funds that are focused on on investing in women. Everybody needs to work at this problem. So, for example, I know that in VC firms, only 12 percent of VC firms um, have women as decision makers and 65 percent of VC firms still don't even have a single female partner. Um, And females are noted to be more likely to invest in female-led companies. So I think that itself, we just don't have enough women investors in decision-making roles investing in women. So that's one of the issues. Tessie, Uh, I want to jump in up there for a moment because I remember Bloomberg did a story. I think it was out during the pandemic. And it was Mm -hmm. even about um, female venture capitalists were less inclined to even invest in female founded ventures. And whether it was pressure within a firm or what have you, it's just like everyone stays away. Help me out. So go ahead, continue with your reasons why, because it's just mind blowing. So it's, I think there's a little bit of, well, you know, this person is an experienced entrepreneur. They've had several exits. Well, if you keep investing in just experienced entrepreneurs that have had prior exits, then you're probably going to keep investing in males because a lot of female-led companies are first-time entrepreneurs and you have to be willing to take a risk on a first-time entrepreneur. And it may appear more risky, but I also think some of it has to do with the way we we ask questions. There's been a lot of research that says that all investors ask women more sort of risk mitigation type questions and we ask men growth mindset questions and so if you're going to change the way you ask questions to your entrepreneurs you're going to have a different outcome in the way you perceive the company so for example at excel start we have a really um, structured way we do diligence and so we make sure that we're asking same type of questions to all of our entrepreneurs. We have a quantitative and a qualitative way that we do it. We have a matrix that we fill out and a a really robust report. But if you're sort of just flying by the seat of your cuffs, then your own subconscious biases are going to determine what type of questions you're asking. Um, And that changes the outcome of how you perceive the company and, and the opportunity that it may be that it may have. What do the data show as far as returns? And who's leading companies? So, I mean, if you think about the data right now, I think there's only been 20 women who have ever led a a company to an IPO. And I don't think that's because women don't want to lead companies to IPOs. I think that there's a bias. Um, One of our companies just recently uh, was determining whether they wanted to hire a certain executive in not the CEO role, but in a, you know, a very senior important role And there was some question around whether or not that woman would be able to potentially in a few years be a key uh, management uh, director while leading the company to an IPO. And a few, not just myself, but another male uh, board member spoke up and said, well, she we haven't even hired her. Let's get her in the door. Let's see how she does. And we'll make a decision when the time comes, whether or not she'll be suited to to be in the role during an IPO. Mm -hmm. So there are some assumptions that are made before women can even get into the door and and make an impact in the company. So devil's advocate a little bit. Sure. Um, because I do believe, especially in a capitalistic society, that mm-hmm. money talks. And if there's sure. a good business, 
I don't care if a mm-hmm. monkey or a frog is running it. Like people are going to invest in it. Is there something yep. else that's missing that just, I mean, look at the creator of Spanx. She created a billion dollar business. Like people, women mm-hmm. create, you know, Kardashians, like whatever, go everywhere you want. Like yeah. people create yeah. billion dollar Oprah. Like people create women specifically create mm-hmm. successful businesses. But I'm just, I'm wondering, is there something else missing in the trajectory um, that doesn't allow women to take their ideas and really run with it or attract, again, the investors that ultimately create a female-run Google alphabet, a female-run Tesla, you know what I mean? Well, I think that, I do think that there are female, I, I think a lot of females when you think about entrepreneurs, a lot of them are thinking about what is in their realm of expertise or what have they experienced in life that drives them to to found a certain company, right? So if a female is finding founding a company based on the female experience and she's pitching it to male venture partners, there is a possibility that isn't going to resonate. Um, and we have to look we have to look at the reality that we're faced with. If you're if the decision makers are going to be men and they're the ones who are, you know, owning the lion's share of investment dollars, then you have to I'm not telling you to change your idea. What I'm suggesting is that you you people need to be aware. Women need to be aware of these biases and then adjust their pitch such that it may still be a wonderful ex, uh, opportunity Mm. based on the female experience, but they need to make sure that they present it in a way that resonates with their male counterpart. Not everything about the female experience will resonate with males. And so you have to perhaps adjust your pitch. Think about how, you know, how are you doing the market sizing? What are you talking about exits? Do you have enough exit potentials? A lot of times, for example, if in a women's health company, whether we like this or not, in med tech, there aren't that many large med tech players that have sizable women's health mm-hmm. divisions. Right. And so if you have a women's health med tech company, but you don't have perhaps a very distinct way of exiting to a and a sizable acquirer that shows an acquisitive nature, then investor is going to push back on that. And so I, I yeah, go ahead. No, that's total, no, 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 no. You're saying really smart things. I, I, I guess that I'm just thinking again. I'm playing devil's advocate. Like if Mark Zuckerberg had been Maria Zuckerberg and she created Facebook, would would she have gotten the money to create mm, Facebook now question. Meta? I don't know because I do see some of our female entrepreneurs, um, and they are. Fab, many of them. I mean, some of them have issues just like our male entrepreneurs do. But I just find that females also don't have as much of a network. Okay. I don't know if it's the sort of that old boys network that continues to prevail, but they just don't seem to know enough investors. And I also find them that they're not as assertive with their investors and asking for introductions. So mm-hmm. only my male in. For example, when we're sitting in the board and we're sort of, well, I have this company and we're experiencing X, Y, Z, this could be helpful. These are why my thoughts are this and I'm giving advice to a company. Most of the time, my male CEOs will say, hey, can you introduce me to that CEO so I can learn a little bit more about, you know, what you're talking about so I can really understand whether it be clinical design or, you know, acquiring customers, um, something another company that it's very rare that a female will proactively ask me it happens oh, that's but interesting. a female will proactively ask me to make introductions for them i have to offer oh. i will go back and look at my rolodex and say who can i introduce you to but they will not proactively ask me as an investor um to make introductions for them which that's a and Huge again, point. I have some. I have some, but th- that makes a big difference. We're going to let the guy, pro- wait, the guy in the room wants to say something. Just want to yes. ask a question. <laughs> Quick. Just want to ask a question. Okay. In just, you know, one phrase, the most exciting area you're investing in right now. Ooh, um, personalizable, tailored med tech companies that function very much like therapeutics and their functionality is able to basically shift and conform to the anatomy of of our human bodies and able to really create therapy in a way that only therapeutics have been able wow. to do in the past. I have to say, I have a niece who's a doctor and she's a good friend um, that has a doctor too. And they say it's amazing like the differences of things that aren't done for women in healthcare. 
what and do you mean? medical devices. Well, I'll talk to you okay. about it. Well, okay. Well, but, but, it's, but it's just the perspective of mm-hmm. and things that are covered by insurance for oh, men yeah. versus women. Right. And just, mm-hmm. um, Matt talked about it with breastfeeding um, for his wife specifically. Mm-hmm. And just things, you know, that come problems and stuff that, you know, there isn't research followed for women. Mm-hmm. So you make such a valid point and you think about the in roads. And I also think about if this money isn't going to these companies, women who are starting mm-hmm. companies, like you think about if they were allowed to run with it, what kind of businesses they would create, what that would mean for, you know, public companies, market caps, economic mm-hmm. momentum, right? Job hiring, like how much we are ignoring at this point. There is actually a company that I know that would have been a fabulous company, would have changed the trajectory of a disease that we all struggle with as women. And unfortunately, because the acquirer spun off their women's health division, the technology was shelved, even after they paid a lot of money for it and never made it to market. It's really sad. That's amazing. That's amazing. Hey, listen, um, incredible stuff. Come back soon. We'd love to continue this conversation with you. I really feel like this was a very productive one because I feel like it's a topic we've talked about for years, um, but you really got to some of the core of, of the problems. Tazneem Dohadwala, she's founding partner at Excel Star Ventures, uh, joining us on Zoom from Boston. Really cool conversation. Yeah, a lot of cool companies they've invested in. Nova Data, Augmentics, and more. This is Bloomberg. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 3 to 6 Eastern. Listen on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, and the Bloomberg Business app. Or watch us live on YouTube. So you might recall our next guest, who we introduced to you just a few months ago. Two small business owners with interesting backstories, Cherie and Tracy Syfax, who also happen to be husband and wife. They co-founded the online dating service, Just the Facts. It's not just online dating, though, that they're doing. They're also expanding their real estate portfolio. Most recently, the pair entered the hospitality sector purchasing Booker's Restaurant in West Philadelphia earlier this year. Bloomberg News Deputy Team Leader for U.S. Equities Jess Menton and I asked Cherie and Tracy why now is the right time to take a chance on a restaurant. The restaurant space, the business is going great. We are um, sales up 26% over the first quarter, and we are excited to be in this position. As you know, we kept the majority of the staff, maybe 75% of the staff we kept there. So we didn't change much, but we elevated the menu, added some special drinks, and it's been a real great well, ride. Over it's the an past interesting summer. dynamic because especially coming out of the pandemic, right, Tim, when you think about how challenging it's been for specific restaurants. That's exactly where my, my head was going to go, right. Jess. Yeah, like if you're going to buy a restaurant right. you know, 2023 when you're coming out of a pan- pandemic, Tracy, is, is not really the time to do it. Can't yeah. find labor. Yes. Costs are going through the roof. Food costs are going up, and then you have this whole like pandemic thing that you got to worry about. What was the? What's the? Uh, you know, what's? Wh- why take a risk like this? Well, we felt we looked at the model. Um, the previous owner Saba had built a great model over six years, so she had built success. It was already pretty much there when we inherited the restaurant, and we just really felt with our profile and our social media presence that we can elevate it and market it in a whole different light. Um, Booker's is located um, not too far from the colleges the hospitals so it's in a prime area um, for that type of um, growth so we really felt that we could really enhance bookers by just our presence. I'm curious what y'all are seeing when it comes to, because Tim brought up labor, and obviously when you think about inflation issues, with what you're seeing, what do you think this tells us about the direction of the economy? Well, a couple of things. I think the economy is doing better than, initially when we started talking about recession, everyone was concerned and worried, and even we were, because we were in the middle of negotiations during that time. We felt good about our business evaluation and the ability to retain employees. The really great thing about being in West Philadelphia, and Philadelphia period is everyone very, is very neighborhood centric so a lot of our employees come right from the neighborhood they can walk to work mm-hmm. so it's rare that you're able to walk to work and not have to work in center city and still be able to make a really good wage mm-hmm. so those things helped us retain and have helped us grow how challenging is that from a business perspective because I feel like at Bloomberg right Tim we're always talking about oh the employment cost index and it's really challenging for businesses as far as to keep up with that type of wage growth yep. what from your perspective and what you hear anecdotally from your employees what is that challenge like. Yeah, so what we think about is every dollar that we spend, we have to figure out what that return on investment is. So we have to look at every single line item. We've done well with having a fractional CFO that really helps us look at not just the food and things like that. 
we adjust. Wait, for explain what a fractional CFO is. I mean, it, it sounds like it's pretty self-explanatory, but yeah. it's, <laughs> it's a different way of saying a part-time CEO. Yes. Basically, okay. a part-time CFO, our accountant has that service and they offer that. And I think sometimes where we go wrong in business, especially in entrepreneurs, is that we try to do it ourselves. We try mm. to wing it ourselves. And having that outside help really helps us look at every single line item. So we know how what percentage we want our labor to be. We know what percentage we want our expenses to be as far as food. So we have to look at those things. Obviously, we have to look at everything and make adjustments for inflation and look at when eggs are up, when butter's up, you know, those types of things to adjust mm. pricing accordingly. It's funny because McDonald's has this sort of fry indicator as far as how many people are adding those on to where they can tell this is what an indicator means for the economy. I'm curious if you have any sort of way to gauge as far as when it comes to spending in the consumer. Well, at this point, we're what, five, four months in. So mm. everything is still a first for us, but we're definitely looking at the market. We definitely look at our sales versus last year. We look at how many seats, not just what the revenue number is up, but actually how many people are coming into the restaurant. So we're assessing all that data and that that helps us with our forecasting um, and it helps us build out um, knowing how much we need to make sure staff is proper, we're properly staffed and that we have enough inventory so that we have, we're able to serve our customers with our menus. Hey, Tracy, give us an idea of, of how you think the economy is based not just on the restaurant, mm -hmm. but the work that you've done in real estate development, uh, what you're seeing in your other businesses right now. Yeah, well, I've always believed in real estate as someone who started my first investments in early 2000, even when the market crashed in 2008. Um, and I lost millions of dollars in the real estate crash. It was still my saving grace as I came out of that that allowed me to continue to do business and actually eventually buy his booker. So I'm always big on economy. I really believe um, in us. I believe that what we can do as a husband and wife team, um, that gives me a bright look on, on what the economy can bring. So I really believe that our combination has really been the proven um, recipe. So it's less about what's happening externally for you. Yes. And that, more about what the two of you can do. Sort of like. You, you, what I'm hearing from you is it doesn't matter how the economy is because you guys can weather it. Oh, absolutely. Um, I'm 30 years in, as being a serial entrepreneur, so I've seen the highs and the lows. I really have felt them. Um, so I really believe that even when we have a bad economy, I think good business, good customer sales in any economy. Do, but do we have a bad economy right now? I don't believe so. No. I don't believe That's so. Not what I believe, yeah. And real estate has always been my anchor as well. So when we put, put it all together, um, that really gave us leverage to do a lot of other things. So mm -hmm. real estate does always tend to be that foundation that if you have that and you're able to get in um, on some really good opportunities, that that propels you and can propel you to other things. Mm -hmm. And you always can leverage it. Do you see any sort of red flags brewing at all when it comes to the real estate space? We always talk so much about when it comes to commercial real estate, but are there things beyond that type of area that you think you're a little weary about right now? Yeah, commercial real estate, me and my wife, we was just talking about, we visit a lot of malls. Mm -hmm. And we were just visiting the mall. And some of the malls that we've been visiting as we've been shopping has been pretty much non-existent when it comes to customers inside stores like they used to be. So it's something that we definitely um, notice in the commercial space. Is that something that would give you pause and you wouldn't want to go into that? I wouldn't want to open up a restaurant in the mall. <laughs> Right, that's where, I was, that's where I was wondering. That's where I was headed with that one. And, and I don't know, we wouldn't have probably purchased the restaurant without being able to purchase the real estate. Yes. So we right. purchased the commercial space, six apartments, and things like that because it gives us so many more opportunities in the event that anything happens with the restaurant. What mm -hmm. are you seeing on the... On the um Landlord tenant side, what are you seeing with the tenants right now? Yeah, so far our tenants have been great. great. We've been really, really fortunate. We believe that we offer a good product and that they acquiesce and they do their part of it too. So we're pretty accessible, we're pretty available, and we just haven't had any tenant um, landlord issues. No, late, but we like to talk to landlords too because they start seeing, okay, well, late rents are a normal, normal part of being a landlord, especially Absolutely. if you have a lot of tenants. Absolutely. Are we seeing more late rents now? Are we seeing people behind you know, we on rents? We were pretty fortunate through the pandemic. We had two people that kind of took advantage of not paying, and that's of what, 20 some odd tenants? Yeah, so a lot. That was less than 10%. Like, we were pretty fortunate. I think, you know, the beauty of Tracy being a developer, we keep our properties really well and things like that. So, you have a good thing, kind of why, you know, mess it up when you think of certain urban communities um, and landlords that are not as invested in mm. your quality of life. So to Tracy's point about service and customer service, we just live the motto of provide a good product and we'll get a good result. Do you guys do the day-to-day -day with that too? 
Meaning? The day-to-day work on that, or do you have a management company? We, we have someone that helps us manage the overall. Okay. Yeah, but Tracy's able to assess whatever needs to be done and is able to you know get a team out there to take care of things. Mm-hmm. We only have about a minute left, but I have to ask about also your dating coaching business. You both met during the height of the pandemic yes. virtually, so tell us a little bit quickly about your dating business. Yeah, so, I, and I don't have as much time for it as I used to because of the <laughs> restaurant, however, and it shifted a little bit because it used to be like how I attracted my husband and all the <laughs> positive things about that and now it's like how are me and my husband really doing business in day to day but ultimately the message is you know fall in love with yourself make sure you understand and know what you mm-hmm. want out I love of that. out of the out of the relationship you out do of you yeah and then <laughs> the thing that you want will will come and find you basically mm-hmm. yes, yeah, I, like that. <laughs> I see you, you nodding Chris. <laughs> but be mindful if, do, if doing you hasn't gotten you the results you're looking for you may want to adjust that yes. a little bit <laughs> cuz that's that. okay too i love that what a great little motto there well, Cherie and Tracy Syfax, great to have you both joining Tim Stenovic and myself here in the Bloomberg Interactive Brokers Studio, who are the founders of Just the Facts, but then also they have all of these different small business entrepreneur type areas like we were just talking about with Booker's Restaurant and Bar. Oh, don't forget Cherie's book, too. Yes. Oh, yes. And of course, we have to talk about what's happening with her book as well with that. So people should check it out as far as Second Act, Living Boldly and Abundantly at Every Age. This is the Bloomberg Business Week podcast, available on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Listen live weekday afternoons from 3 to 6 Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, TuneIn, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also watch us live every weekday on YouTube and always on the Bloomberg Terminal.